Hello, you're listening to Yellow King Film Boy. Darren Aronofsky, over the last 20 years, has made a name for himself as a director who likes to polarize his audience. He is no stranger to controversy. His films have been described as genre-breaking, disruptive, and Aronofsky himself lauded as Hollywood's most ambitious director. His filmography is as diverse as any other modern-day director. Films such as Requiem for a Dream, Black Swan and Mother, The Wrestler, The Fountain, showcase his hypnotic way of telling bleak stories that divide audiences and cause a reaction. And that's the way Aronofsky wants it. He once said, I want you to cheer and I want you to boo. What I don't want is for you to do nothing because then I will feel let down. But what are Aronofsky's favorite films? What movies have inspired the director? After looking at numerous interviews online, here is a list of films that Aronofsky has stated as being his favorite films. First film on the list is Adrian Lin's psychological horror, Jacob's Ladder, a trippy nightmare of a film about a Vietnam veteran haunted by fragmentary visions of Francis Bacon-like figures with quivery heads. The film has over the years become a cult classic. Aronofsky's nightclub scene in Black Swan was the most complicated scene in the film. It involved over 1,000 manipulated images for just over 45 seconds of screen time and was inspired by the party scene in Jacob's Ladder, where Tim Robbins hallucinates and starts seeing demons. Here is a clip of Aronofsky talking about it. And there's a lot of subtle things. I don't know if in the dance club scene, mm-hmm. um, when they're on the floor, every single one of those frames is painted. Uh, meaning that they're all manipulated mm-hmm. and there's a whole world of subliminal sh- shit going on <laughs> which I think you know will be fun for the blu-ray crowd mm-hmm. it was reminding me a little bit of that whole sequence was running a little bit of uh, Jacob's Ladder oh yeah sure <laughs> and I'm thinking like yeah with the strobe yeah, yeah. I mean yeah I've got a few reference uh, referrals uh, it's one of my favorite films so it's very flattering Angel Heart was the first time Aronofsky saw Mickey Rourke on screen and he was instantly impressed and it was this performance that led him to pick Rourke for the lead role in The Wrestler. Aronofsky said, I became aware of Mickey Rourke when I saw Angel Heart. I was backpacking in Europe when I was 18 and went to see the movie because I was a big Lisa Bonet fan. I was from Brooklyn and they filmed the Cosby show down the street. I remember being blown away by his performance. He was so cool, so tough and so soft at the same time. I got to know Homeboy when I started working with Mickey. He asked if I'd ever seen his boxing film that he'd written and he gave me a tape. Not many actors have armor like that. Then you look into his eyes and he's got a jelly heart. Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull was a major influence on The Wrestler. Aronofsky states, well, Raging Bull is masterful in many different ways. I believe it's a very different type of film to The Wrestler but you know, it's been a major influence. I feel it's more of an impressionistic film. I believe Scorsese was using the camera as a paintbrush, especially in the fighting scenes. I watched that film and I question whether it's possible to make something like that today. Raging Bull is an art film and it's harder to get money for those kinds of projects. Film number four on the list is Perfect Blue, an anime horror mystery from 1997. Aronofsky was a huge fan of the film, so much so that he purchased the rights to the movie with a view to directing a live action remake. That project never got off the ground, but Aronofsky did lift a bathtub scene from Perfect Blue for his next film, Requiem for a Dream. Many people state that Black Swan is also inspired by Perfect Blue, but Aronofsky denies it. He states, There are similarities between the films, but it wasn't influenced by it. It really came out of Swan Lake, the ballet. We wanted to dramatize the ballet. That's why it's kind of up here and down there, because ballet is big and small in lots of ways. Akira Kurosawa's Ikiru is next up on the list. The film's use of sound design came to Aronofsky's mind when making The Fountain. Unfortunately, the studio wouldn't allow it. Aronofsky about the film says, It is really amazing use of sound design by Kurosawa. 
in the film Ikiru. The man is just finding out that he has terminal cancer. Kurosawa had the idea that you're so lost in your own head that you've completely cut off from the environment around you. All the visual cues he used from the background, from the wedding arc, it was just brilliant. Kurosawa went directly to no noise, so there's actually no sound in the soundtrack. He went completely silent, and I wanted to do the same in the fountain, but the studio wouldn't allow us to do it, because apparently someone might get really confused and believe a mistake had happened. I was forced to use footsteps, and it still kind of kills me. You're not allowed to have an empty soundtrack in a studio picture. John Huston's 1972 neo-noir boxing drama Fat City stars Stacy Keach, Jeff Bridges, and tells the story of a washed up boxer who tries to show a young hopeful the ropes. Aronofsky drew on the film for inspiration for the wrestler, especially the atmospheric vibe, the poetry and the naturalism. The only movie the legendary director John Huston made about boxing. Huston had once been a boxer himself. He hired a few of his old boxer mates from his old boxing days in the movie in bit parts and supporting roles. Then we have a number of classic films that need no explanation. Two films by Terry Gilliam, his dystopian science fiction film Brazil and his adventure fantasy Time Bandits, Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, Sergio Leone's classic westerns Once Upon a Time in the West and The Good, Bad and the Ugly, and another Akira Kurosawa movie Yojimbo. Saturday Night Fever made a big impact on Aronofsky as a child. When it was released in 1977, it became a sensation. It made John Travolta a megastar and brought disco into the mainstream. It was the highest grossing dance movie of all time until Aronofsky's Black Swan was released in 2010. The film was rated R when it was released. The studio was very eager to attract younger people to the film because of the success of the BG soundtrack. So they cut the film by a few minutes and the shorter version was given a PG rating. The PG version was released in 1978. Aronofsky says of the film, I was lucky to grow up in Brooklyn when two major musical forms sort of came and took over the world. It's so easy to forget how good of a movie Saturday Night Fever is. It was way over my head at the time. In fact, it was my first R-rated movie. I guess I was seven or eight when it came out and stormed the world. Me and my sister were dying to see it and my dad was not having it, but my mum was like, everyone's seeing it, it's all going to go over their head. Coming in at number 13, we have Spike Lee's masterpiece, Do The Right Thing. Set on the hottest day of the summer, the film explores the conflicts of racial inequality in a predominantly African-American community in New York. Aronofsky says, it was a major film when it came out for all of us because New York was in a very different place than it was in 1977. Race relations were really boiling over and Spike Lee completely tapped into what was in everyone's head every time you got on the subway. Every time you walked down the street, he just made it a timeless tale. Spike is able to put a stylistic spin on everything, yet also make everything emotionally true and real. He was able to capture all the pain that was going on, but also have this humour and mischievous style. Jonathan Demme's Stop Making Sense, a 1984 American concert film featuring a live performance by the band Talking Heads. Aronofsky says, The way Demme decided to shoot it and how he captured it it was perfect. That for me is the great thing. When the camera is pushing the story forward and working so well with the music. Breaking Away is a 1979 American coming of age comedy drama, a touching tale of youthful initiation into adulthood that embraces the good old fashioned small town family values and tells the story of a boy obsessed with the Italian cycling team while trying to get the attention of a local girl. The film is ranked number eight on the American Film Institute's 100 Most Inspiring Movies of All Time. West Side Story is Aronofsky's favorite musical. He says of the film, it's perfect. 
This kind of realism mixed with the fantastical is something I'm just very attracted to and has definitely been a big influence. Final film on the list is Stanley Kubrick's Vietnam War movie Full Metal Jacket. Aronofsky says of the film, the first half of Full Metal Jacket is all about order and turning these human beings into machines. But there's this one piece of chaos, which is this overweight soldier who is just slowly picked on until he eventually explodes. Then it's all about bringing these machines and this order into chaos. Suddenly the whole shooting style changes and it's a completely different movie. I feel that final shot of the movie is all about taking the grid of that order and sticking it over the chaos while they're in hell, literally. Full Metal Jacket was the first film Kubrick edited on a computer. The film was based on the book The Short Timers by Gustav Hasford. Kubrick loved the book but he didn't like the title so he changed it after he discovered the phrase Full Metal Jacket which describes the casing of a bullet in a gun catalogue. And that is Darren Aronofsky's list of favourite films. What do you reckon? Any films you believe are overrated? And what is your favourite Aronofsky film? As always, your listening is much appreciated. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.